we'll, we'll debrief about this afterwards, okay? All right, good luck. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Good morning. How are you doing today? Actually, we ran into a bit of uncertain situation today. Unfortunately, the Zevan couldn't join us, but we have fantastic Rebecca and Rabi with us. So we are fortunate that they are here today and they will guide us how to proceed further. And as usual, we are looking for a case. So if someone has a case, please do volunteer and it doesn't need to be a well-crafted case. Even if you have some important data, we can work with that, no issue with that. And we also work to volunteers. So now I would like to pass mic to Ravi to guide us further. Hello, hello everybody. It looks like uh, Zavin unfortunately is still rounding with his team uh, and isn't able to make it. And you know, this is just the power of this community. Literally um, let everybody in, ask Rebecca if she has time to, and the space to facilitate and here she is. Um, and then um, I actually <laughs> um, threw Kirzan in the hot seat to co-facilitate with her, even though he's declining, I think that he will be absolutely fantastic. So I, I unfortunately have to duck out um, to do a couple of things, but I'm leaving you in the very capable hands of Rebecca and Kirzan, who will, who have discussed many times before and will wow us with their wisdom. So please jump on into the case and um, there's really um, leave you in no better hands than the two folks here. Hi, Rebecca, you wanna say hi? Thanks, Robbie. Hey everyone, I'm Rebecca Berger. I'm a hospitalist at Cornell in New York City. Um, pinch hitting today for Zavin, who was my senior resident when I was an intern. So I think I have to, uh, to give him a little payback for everything he taught me. Um, we're looking for, uh, for two discussants and one case. So if we can have some Brave souls. Um, it looks like I see some familiar faces here, maybe some new faces. So um, uh, we look forward to having some uh, some familiar or new voices with us today. I unfortunately do not have a reflection because even though I tuned in for a few minutes of NeuroVMR yesterday, I was multitasking, so can't uh, can't give you any eloquent reflections there. But um, but hoping we can get a couple of discussants and a case presenter. We'll give people two more minutes until we start calling on volunteers. Something we, uh, we prefer not to do because we love the enthusiasm to come from you guys. So jump in if you have a case or if you're willing to be a discussant. If you haven't discussed before, um, I can just let you guys know what that, what that is like and what it feels like. And um, even if it's your first time here, you can still be a discussant. So, and the case presenter is going to walk us through a case and they're going to give us um, aliquots. They're going to give us chunks of information about the case, the history, um, the physical exam, the labs, the imaging. And all we ask is that you think out loud, um, that you take the information that was given and process it with whatever training you have. And some of you guys hopefully are medical students. Some people maybe are residents in training. Other people like me who are attendings but still learning every day. Um, so all we ask is that you, you take the information and, uh, and just walk us through how your brain is, is processing all of that. Um, you know, thinking about what diagnoses come to mind, what, more, what additional information you're looking for. Um, it's, a, it's a very lukewarm seat, not a hot seat. We, uh, we really, um, we encourage people at all levels to, to jump in and, and just kind of walk us through your thought process. So it looks like uh, Nalayan, you have a case. Um, and then Hans, I think volunteered himself by saying he was still afraid to discuss. And fear can be a great motivator in these settings. So Hans, can we count on you to, uh, to overcome your fear today? 
Excellent. Thank you so much. So it sounds like we have a case presenter and we have one discussant. All we need is one more discussant. So while we're waiting, why don't we have um, Nalayan, and you'll have to correct my pronunciation of your name as well as Hans, um, unmute and introduce themselves while we're waiting for one more brave uh, discussant. Just barely, it's very soft. So my name is Hans and um, I studied medicine at Ross University and I'm presently, right after graduation, a um, clinical skills facilitator there, hoping to match. So either in Canada where I come from or in the States, depends. So this fall I'm taking the NAC OSCE uh, for the other exams. Thank you, Hans. Is it slightly better now? Much better, thank you. Oh, so hello everyone, uh, my name is Nilayan. I'm a final year medical student from New Delhi, India. And this is my first time presenting the case. I have discussed uh, quite, quite a few number of times, but first time presenting. Excellent, thank you Nilayan for joining. And we have one more spot, one more very warm and inviting lukewarm seat for anybody else. Sukriti, thank you for um, reminding us. If possible, we'd love somebody who identifies as a woman um, to, to join us as well. We're always looking to um, amplify voices that aren't always as loud. I see lots, lots of potential discussants here with us, 34 of us on the, on the Zoom today. One more. Okay, I think if we're running low on time, why don't we do this? Let's, um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, we will have Nalayan present the first aliquot of information. We'll have Hans, you'll take the first crack and then Kirtan, you can follow up um, with anything else to add after Hans. And then hopefully during that first aliquot, somebody will be inspired to, to be our second discussant. And by the time we finish with the next aliquot of information, they will be willing to jump in and discuss. How does that sound? So this is an open invitation for all of you guys on the call that um, whenever one of you gets inspired by Hans, uh, Hans's bravery, um, they can jump in. Carl, we have a discussant. Amazing. Thank you. Um, so Carl, uh, you'll go ahead and take the second piece of information and then I will jump in after. Sounds everyone ready good. to go? Hi, everyone. Nice to be back. Carl, can you just reintroduce yourself? Tell us where you're coming from and what level of training you're in? Yeah, of course. Um, I'm Carl. I'm a uh, first day PGY3 um, at the University of Colorado. Um, hopefully bound for rheumatology this time next year. Awesome. Carl, I think I heard you discuss a case last week and I was blown away. So I'm very excited to work with you. It was, I, you you did hear my voice regionally. So I was like trying to hang back, but I'm awesome. back. Great. Okay, let's get started. So I have divided my case into five aliquots. The last aliquot would give the diagnosis. So coming to the first aliquot, a 59-year-old man is referred to our emergency room with complaints of vomiting, diaphoresis, and altered mental status. Is that aliquot one, or are you going to give us more in the first? That's all. If you want more, I can, uh, I can give you more, but uh, I thought this is uh, enough. Plenty. That's plenty to start. Excellent. So Hans, you're up first. What do you think about this first piece of information? The first thing that came into my mind when I read uh, vomiting and altered mental uh, status and diaphoresis, any kind of intoxication 
from a cholinergic drug, it could be a pharma. That would, but that would be too easy for me, VMR. <laughs> but that's the first thought I had. Um, of course, now we could think of um, anything in the brain, like uh, maybe some uh, metabolic disorder of some kind that might cause the vomiting and uh, diaphoresis, auto mental status. An infection could be a possibility. Then, of course, secondarily, um, again, a metabolic disorder like an electrolyte disorder, like an infection of the gastrointestinal tract. Hmm. I have no more things to say at this stage. So maybe the other discussant. Beautiful. Kirtan, what are your thoughts? We need, the, we need the time course anyway. Was it sudden? Was it gradual to rule out other possibilities such as maybe a, some malignancy? So the, the next stage would be to look at the HPI and get an idea of the time frame what happened, and of course, his occupation and past medical history. Thank you, Hans. Kirtan, thoughts? Yes, so actually, I am of no mess to you guys, so I won't be facilitating, to be honest. I mean, it, it will be a special VMR where we have three discussions rather than one discussion, so I can go like that. Yeah, so I'm right there with Hans that when we have got altered mental status and vomiting, first thing first, we have to consider that what if it is a electrolyte disturbances, right? And other things which can be fixed easily like hypoglycemia, right? Hyponatremia, hypokalemia, all of them can present as altered mental status. Now, if we throw in the another symptom that is vomiting, we have to consider what if this patient has got gastroenteritis, right? Common things being common. If the patient has gastroenteritis and the patient will be vomiting, and patient may even have diarrhea, and both of them are common sources of electrolyte disturbances, so that can present as altered mental status. Furthermore, if diarrhea is prominent, then you can get metabolic acidosis, right? And metabolic acidosis can also cause altered mental status. Now, if we want to find the cause of the vomiting apart from gastroenteritis, then maybe we can look at some endocrinologic disturbances, where sometimes hyperthyroidism, adrenal insufficiency can present as vomiting in altered mental status. Now, talking about the diaphoresis, the diaphoresis usually means that your sympathetic system is in overdrive because when the sympathetic nervous system fires, it stimulates the sweat glands which is present in your skin and that's why you get diaphoresis. So anything which can cause hyperactivation of sympathetic nervous system, it can cause that. So what can cause hyperactivity of sympathetic nervous system? So again, if we come back to our initial hypothesis, what if this patient has gastroenteritis, then even hypovolemia can be a trigger for sympathetic nervous system activation because your body will try to maintain the blood pressure. And while doing so, the sympathetic nervous system will fire and that can cause diaphoresis. Even hypoglycemia is one of those things which can present in this way because when your glucose levels falls down, other counter-regulatory hormones like cortisol, epinephrine, all of them starts firing and that can cause diaphoresis along with the activity of epinephrine and norepinephrine. So those are my thoughts. And so, Carl, do you have any other thoughts? So, Rebecca, can you correct me if I'm wrong? Um. Yeah, Kirtan, I think um, we, we got a vast differential at this point, um, which you really elegantly went through. But I think uh, it's a sort of repeat two things that we uh, we hear a lot, like number one, tempo is queen. So it um, would be very helpful to get some information about that. Uh, number two being that nausea, vomiting uh, are rarely like super helpful localizing symptoms in themselves or maybe help will help us less narrow our differential than... Um, either the altered mental status or maybe some other information that we get in the next aliquot. Um, but certainly agree with like this gentleman's coming into the ED, um, ABCs first, you know, uh, what's his level of obtundation? Like, does he have a, uh, do we have airway concerns? Um, is he adequately volume resuscitated from his nausea and vomiting? Um, is there anything else acutely life-threatening potentially going on? Hypoglycemia, cardiac ischemia, um, you know, in something intracranial, 
um, agree with all of that. But uh, once we stabilize this gentleman, it'll be nice to get a little more information um, so we can narrow a bit. Thank you, gentlemen, for that discussion. In the interest of time, I won't speak long. I think just to echo what Carl was saying, I think that none of the symptoms we're getting yet are particularly localizing, right? As you said, Kirtan, the vomiting definitely could localize us to the GI tract, but vomiting can also be a symptom of systemic illness, right? It can be intracranial, increased intracranial pressure. It could be systemic illness. Um, same thing with altered mental status, right? That could localize us inside the CNS, um, but probably more commonly things that we see are um, are kind of systemic processes, as you said, metabolic processes, infections, um, uh, endocrinopathies, things like that. So I agree. I think time course is going to be key, right? Did the vomiting lead to an electrolyte abnormality, which caused our altered mental status, or are these two things happening simultaneously, in which case we need to come up with a unifying etiology for both of them. So um, with that, in the interest of time, let's hear more from the lion. That was some excellent, excellent discussion. So carrying on, uh, the patient was apparently well three days back when he developed vomiting, diaphoresis, and increasing fatigue while traveling. Two days back, he reported having a fever for which he took an aspirin. Later that night, he was found in his room by his wife, non-verbal, unable to stand up, but he only responded to painful stimuli. Uh, paramedics were called, and uh, I will give you uh, some vitals as well in this ad So the vitals are thus, uh, blood pressure of, oh, wait, I'll give this right some time. Okay, blood pressure of 132 over 82 millimeters of mercury, heart rate of 132 beats per minute, respiratory rate of 26 breaths per minute with 94% oxygen saturation on two liters of oxygen and temperature of 40 degrees Celsius. Mm. Pupils were not, pupils were non-reactive and bilaterally three millimeters. Blood glucose was 148 milligram per second. Uh, moving on, uh, well, the patient uh, was started on some medications which consisted of some antibiotics and the patient slightly recovered. He reported feeling awful and having diffuse muscle pain, neck stiffness, and pain while swallowing. No, no headache, no rash. Uh, in the past medical history, uh, the patient is a, uh, the patient has gout. Okay. okay, so the patient has gout, but he's currently on no known medications and uh, no known allergies either. Patient uh, reports drinking alcohol occasionally, but no smoking and no use of illicit drugs. And the patient reports no recent dental work, no unusual exposures, including tick or mosquito bites. So that is my alipot number two. Great. Carl, you want to take the first stab at this one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think uh, this is... This is kind of ominous, and I think this might be a case uh, when this when this gentleman hits the emergency room of like TX before DX, because um, we have a gentleman who is now we we know the time course is rather acute. Um, we heard that he was febrile. He is extremely altered. He's tachycardic. Um, this is kind of um, infection until proven otherwise for me. Whether that's um, kind of just a sepsis picture and or. Um, something that would be particularly high on my differential here is this a CNS infection, um, meningitis, encephalitis. Um, and I will sort of expand my differential in a minute, but I mean, completely agree. Um, again, airway management, volume resuscitation, kind of, uh, you know, sepsis bolus up front. Um, empiric antibiotics, absolutely the right move in this case. I would do, um, you know, Bancomycin, ceftriaxone, acyclovir, um, plus or minus ampicillin. I heard that this gentleman was 59, so he's not quite at that like 65 age cutoff where we commonly uh, will like treat listeria empirically. But agree with all of that. Um, I think this gentleman needs a stat head CT followed by an LP um, to rule out anything kind of structural going on intracranially. 
And then also to the purpose of the CT would be to make sure that the LP is safe. Um, but I think we absolutely need to um, prove to ourselves this is not a CNS infection. Um, so it'll be interesting to hear about that in the next aliquot. Um, I'm also struck by the degree or the height of the fever uh, for this gentleman. Um, I would actually almost call it temperature 40 Celsius. I would almost call that hyperthermia, which kind of raises as well some non-infectious things in the differential. Um, thinking about like certain toxidromes, anticholinergic being one that comes to mind, um, serotonin syndrome and neuroleptic malignant syndrome actually would be others. Um, the latter for me, some recency bias there because I just took care of my first NMS in, in case in the unit, somebody who was very sick. Um, certainly something that's associated with like acute time course and marked hyperthermia. So all that being said, um, let's rule out infection, throw out a few other things on the differential. Um, and then lastly, yeah, I agree with everything that's been said in the chat. We do need to determine this gentleman's um, immune status and HIV status in particular, because that'll be a huge branch point for us. Beautiful, Carl. Hans, anything else to add? Any other thoughts here? No, I think because of the high temperature, I was thinking infection as well right away, possibly a bacterial infection. But then of course they mentioned NMS, which is the neuroleptic malignant syndrome. That would be a possibility if the patient is on any particular medications, but none of them were mentioned here. So as men mentioned before, we need a CT scan of the head or an MRI. And the next step would be an LP with a spinal fluid analysis and a blood culture before starting empiric uh, antibiotics. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you both so much. I, I totally agree with everything that's been said. Carl, if you change your mind and you decide you want to do hospital medicine, let me know because I'm, I'm sure we can find you a, a job somewhere. So the um, again, I think the you know what we're getting in this next aliquot of information is, is that this gentleman has an acute presentation of illness, right? So these symptoms have only been going on for three days. And the acuity of onset here really strongly favors infection. Um, over all of the other etiologies we've talked about of his decompensation, um, right? We heard that the three days ago he was fine. And then he all of a sudden developed this vomiting fatigue. Um, we heard he was traveling. And I think we're all curious to know what that travel history looks like, because I think anytime we're thinking about an infectious history, um, there's really two main pieces of information we need, right? We need to know more about the host and their immune status, as you guys have mentioned. So we need to know if this gentleman is um, immunocompromised or immunocompetent. Based on his past medical history, we have no indication that he's immunocompromised, right? We haven't heard about a history of malignancy or a bone marrow transplant or a solid organ transplant. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, and all we have in terms of his behaviors is, is bites and, and alcohol. We don't know what his sexual history um, is. So I think, you know, we don't yet know whether he's at risk for something like HIV, which um, could be lurking without having been diagnosed. So again, question number one is gonna be about his, his immune status as a host. And then question number two is gonna be about what his exposures have been. So again, as we said, he's been traveling. We don't know where this case is taking place. So um, exposures, we heard about ticks and mosquitoes, but exposure to other animals, which might put him at risk of, of leptospirosis and other kind of, um, uh, you know, we, so I think somebody threw rabies in the chat, right? Any bats in his vicinity. So um, we'd love to know more about any other exposures there. Um, and then I think, Carl, you bring up a good point about his temperature. It's definitely, you know, within the realm of possibility that this could still be infection. We do see adults at this age mount temps of that's probably what, like 103 Fahrenheit, you know, 40 Celsius, um, but it's getting up there, right? And we do have to consider non-infectious um, causes of, of fevers. This gentleman is clearly inflamed and his syndrome is quite acute. Um, the fact that his pupils were small and non-reactive is interesting to me. That definitely kind of sounds like a, a toxidrome, um, but we didn't get a history of him having ingested anything. We would want to take a better history once he's more awake. Um, it doesn't sound like they were described as pinpoint, but they are small and non-reactive. Um, and then again, blood pressure is reassuring, but heart rate is not, right? This gentleman is, is clearly sick. That, that uh, Kirtan, you talked to us before about that kind of 
a sympathetic overdrive that's causing his diaphoresis, it's clearly causing his heart rate to run as well. So I think uh, a lot more information that, that we need here. I was also struck by what I think was hypoxia, right? Um, Lion, correct me if I misheard, I think 94% on two liters. Um, Absolutely, which, yes. Yeah, so, so that's not, not to be expected right here. So the question is, are we dealing with a pulmonary infection? We haven't gotten the rest of his, um, his uh, exam yet, right? But is this a pneumonia? And if so, is this a, a typical cause of pneumonia, like a, like a strep pneumo? Um, or is this a, an atypical pneumonia? Again, depending on his, um, his travel history, we don't typically see things like you know, Legionella and chlamydia pneumonias cause these acute dramatic presentations like this, although they can Legionella specifically. Um, but, uh, but interesting, um, you know, making sure we get that additional history. Great. Okay, Nalayan, are we ready for, uh, for aliquot number three? Some excellent out of world discussion going on here. So moving on to aliquot number three, I will give you all the physical examination right now. So the patient was lethargic, diaphoretic, flushed, and was unable to sit up. In the cardiovascular system, normal S1 and S2, without any murmurs, rubs, or brewing. On abdominal examination, normal bowel sounds were heard. The abdomen was soft, without tenderness, distension, or organomegaly. Uh, on general physical examination, the skin was found to be mottled over the abdomen and there was a rash in the form of libido-reticularis pattern. Mm. Uh, there were also purpuric rashes on the hand. The hand and feet were initially cold and the muscles were diffusely tender. On I'll give some time. All right, so on CNS examination, the patient was oriented, but his memory of recent events was impaired. He could only follow one step command. Speech was fluent without paraphrasic errors. Uh, the deep tendon reflex were mute in the ankle and the plantar reflexes were, flex the plantar reflexes were flexor. And that concludes the aliquot number three. Yes. <laughs> yes, so actually extremely good physical examination findings and the Rebecca and Carl actually discussed the previous aliquot so well that there is only little to add, but the rash is very important. So now when we have the purpuric rash and along with that, the extremities are cold, which definitely means that at least in the extremities, despite the blood pressure being all right, the perfusion is not as great as we would expect it to be. Furthermore, given the systemic findings, that is the involvement of CNS based on the pupillary findings, along with the rash and the muscle pain, raises the concern about certain infection and parasite. So if you see the HPI, then the patient had diffuse muscle pain. So now there are only a handful of infections which can do that. So starting from the basics, if this is indeed a staphylococcal toxic shock syndrome, it doesn't look like it because the patient is not in actually shock, but those syndromes can actually present as these purpuric rashes. Apart from that, classically the infections which hits the endothelium of the blood vessels like rickettsia and elrichia and aplasma, all of those infections can present in this fulminant manner. And often the antibiotics that we give classically, like let's say ceftriaxone, let's say ciprofloxacin, they won't target those antigens because we need doxycycline for that. So atypical infections, as you earlier mentioned, like leptospirosis, tularemia, because all of them can cause rhabdomyolysis. We know that. So it will be interesting to see how the CK levels of this patient were. Apart from that, one other interesting finding is what if this patient has meningococcemia? Now, usually meningococcemia occurs in younger patients who have exposure to other college groups or other students like that, because we see the outbreaks of meningococcemia in college dormitories, but it can be community acquired too. And meningococcemia can cause what is known as purpura fulminance like picture. And given the fact that our patient had levator reticularis certainly raises the concern that we may be dealing with some hypercoagulability like state. 
because when you have purpura fulminans you have to coagulate the blood vessels like venules and when the venules get choked up with the blood that's when you get that classic net like rash over the over your body apart from that certain autoimmune conditions like anti phospholipid antibody syndrome can present with duodenal reticularis like rash but those conditions won't present so late but still it is useful to consider them back at of our mind then i would also like to see how the platelet levels were like because things like thrombos thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura hemolytic uremic syndrome they are also emergencies we need to fix them immediately and they can also present with cns findings as well as the cutaneous findings because ctp can cause stroke and all other intracranial features which can explain the pinpoint pupils in our case so those are my thoughts and talking about some rare infections apart from leptospirosis rickettsia ehrlichia also hantavirus syndrome because we know hantavirus and leptospirosis are essentially similar in each and every manner they can cause renal failure they can cause hepatic failure they can cause pulmonary failure they can cause systemic signs and symptoms including thrombocytopenia which can explain the purpuric rash in our case so these are my thoughts now can you help me rebecca and hands how we can proceed further in this manner How do I think, you are next? I think all I would like to add is, you know, now looking at his labs and see the WBC hemoglobin, whether there is any hemoconcentration. And as uh, Kirtan mentioned, we want to look at CK and maybe in a non-specific ESR and then go from there, whether we need any kind of serology for particular viruses. and possibly an LP with a spinal fluid analysis. Beautiful discussion here. So I think um, just to echo a lot of what Kirtan already said, I, I wanna keep moving to the next aliquot for the, for the sake of time since we started a little late today. I think, um, I totally agree here, right? I think the most striking part of his um, exam um, I think we already knew that he was a little bit altered. So I think the lethargy and the diaphoresis wasn't terribly surprising to us. I think this rash um, may really be something that it can help us um, hone our differential a little bit further. I think the, uh, the involvement of his extremities um, suggests that his small vessels, maybe his capillaries might be involved and his, his abdominal involvement may suggest medium vessel involvement. And I think the main question we have here is whether this is still an infectious process. And Kirtan, you gave us a beautiful list of kind of both common and uncommon um, uh, infections that can, that can present in this kind of dramatic way, um, as well as, um, uh, you know, potentially something like a vasculitis. Although again, I think we've decided that's, that's really a, a diagnosis of exclusion here. Um, the, the, um, Muscle aches, the myalgias, right? The question of, of involvement of rhabdomyolysis. So as you suggested, there are certain, certain infections that might um, have a higher prevalence of rhabdo. And I think one question I'm asking myself here is whether this is um, you know, maybe a more typical presentation of an, of an uncommon infection, like some of the um, zoonoses that you mentioned earlier, Kirtan, like a rickettsial infection, right? Which could definitely cause rash, fever, uh, these kind of systemic symptoms, or is this a more atypical presentation of a more common infection, right? I think we've seen bacteremias uh, present in a lot of different ways. We don't really have a source here, um, but I'm still keeping that on the differential here, right? Is this, you know, we do know, for example, that, that endocarditis can often have um, kind of vasculitic manifestations, right? So is the involvement on his fingers um, or on his extremities and on his, um, on his abdomen, is that actually a manifestation of a of a small vessel vasculitis or um, something like that related to, to something like an endocarditis. We don't have any risk factors here per se, um, but that's something I'm keeping on the list here, right? As we, as we probably are empirically treating for, as we've said, bacterial meningitis, this gentleman is surely gonna get some doxycycline based on the, the rash, the fever, and the um, you travel history, although we don't know where he's been. Um, uh, again, the question of, um, of a kind of more typical bacterial infection still is on my list. Um, and remember that, you know, people, I think, Asuka, you just, you just put this in the chat just as it came to me as well, that, um, that ticks uh, are often co-infected, right? So you would wanna figure out where your local ep epidemiology is and know that, um, that you could be dealing with multiple processes at once, right? So this syndrome does not look like a Lyme disease, right? People don't typically get um, this kind of uh, fulminant septic type presentation with Lyme. 
Um, they surely can with Babesia and anaplasma. Um, those typically are associated with LFT abnormalities, thrombocytopenia. Um, I would have to double check on, on rickettsia and whether there's a co-infection with either of those geographically or in terms of the tick type. Excellent. I think, Nalayan, we are ready for some labs. Pearls after pearls dropping. Oh my God, the discussion is so amazing. So coming on to investigations, hemoglobin was 12.5 with the reference range of 13.5 to 17.5, so low. A white blood count of 6,000 with a differential of uh, neutrophils being 81%, lymphocytes being 8%, and monocytes being 11%. Platelet count of 32,000. All right. Um, an ESR of 37. Growth thrombin time of 17.7, which is based. Fibrinogen of 538. And um, all right. Sodium of 138. Potassium of 3.3, .3, chloride of 105, carbon dioxide of 17.8, creatinine of 3.4, BUN of 53, and bilirubin total of 3.2. Wait, have I lost? All right. And direct bilirubin of 2.6, AST of 128, ALT of 72. LDH of 398, creatin kinase of 1409, that is 1409, CKMB of 13.5, drop T of 0.16, and testing for occult blood in stool was positive. A blood smear was done, which showed no intracellular or extracellular organisms. And a test X-ray and a CT of brain, abdomen, pelvis without contrast. Oh, wait, have I gone too fast? Okay, was normal. A CT without contrast of brain, abdomen, pelvis. And at last, I will also give you guys a urine analysis since we had a problematic KFT. So a specific gravity of 1.025, a pH of 5.5, a bilirubin of 1 plus, albumin of 2 plus, occult blood of 3 plus. An examination of the sediment revealed 3 to 5 RBCs three to five WBCs, few bacteria, few renal tubular cells, and some amorphous and some amorphous crystals. And that is aliquot number four. Aliquot number five will consist of two investigations, in fact three, which will give you the diagnosis. Hey, Carl, you want to take the first stab at this one? I think Hans did the last one, if I recall right. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Carl. Absolutely. Uh, remind me what that PT is going to be in an INR. I was just kind of wondering that. I like am so bad at looking at PTs. Is that like markedly abnormal or kind of normal? Slightly up. Slightly up. Okay. Yeah. It's going to be oh. one point something. Okay. Okay. Probably mid ones, I think. Gotcha. Someone so correct me if I'm wrong. Sorry, 1.5. Mid ones. I think I get a little bonus point for that, right? Okay. So like, not normal. Um, we have the thrombocytopenia. We don't have the decreased fibrinogen. Um, I agree with what's been said in the chat. I would love to sort of round out the hemolysis workup uh, by seeing a smear haptoglobin. We have an LDH and a T billy that are sort of mildly elevated, though not terribly exciting. Um, and I mention all this because, uh, number one, I was thinking about... Um, kind of meningococcemia, purpura fulminans, complicated by DIC. Um, and then number two, I love the thoughts about TTP that have been raised. Uh, I still want to convince myself this isn't number one meningococcemia. Um, but I think that TTP is like definitely on the differential. We have that whole, I think, pentad going for us. 
Um, we have like a mild anemia, although not clear if it's hemolytic, but we have thrombocytopenia, altered mental status, renal failure. Um, so that is, uh, that's pretty high up. Um, I don't have a ton else to add though, until we are able to uh, see that LP and kind of make a decision, is this infectious or not? Love that. Hans, any additional thoughts from what Carl said? You know, I have um, a lot of questions about the possible viruses because we have very low platelets, we have kidney involvement, and apparently even the liver is involved somehow because AST is very high in ALT. And then we have an LDH, which is indicative of some hemolysis, but very mildly. And then we have CK1409. So we have muscle involvement as well. So this could explain to a certain degree the LDH. So I need to learn or study a little bit more about viruses here because something is going on and it is very sudden with a high fever. And we have blood in, in the stool. And of course, we, the kidneys are involved too. So hunter virus is something that you don't even notice that you inhale it through your lungs in your cottage in Northern Ontario. That could happen anytime but I have nothing else to add. Beautiful discussions here, gentlemen. I think these labs are, are markedly abnormal, right? And I think give us um, a lot of additional information that help us both kind of acknowledge how sick he is. I think we already recognize that at first, um, but also hopefully start to guide us towards the differential. And sometimes when I get overwhelmed by by data like this, I just like to start listing out all of the abnormalities and then figuring out how I can kind of lump them together to make sense of them, right? So um, the things that we have here are uh, mild anemia, right? Marked thrombocytopenia, mild coagulopathy uh, with no evidence of DIC, right? Uh, marked acute kidney injury, uh, mildly elevated liver function uh, tests or transaminases, I should say, uh, evidence of rhabdomyolysis with an elevated CK and uh, a kind of, um, occult blood in the stool with minimal RBCs, right? And trying to piece all of these things together. I think as has been said, I think the thrombocytopenia is probably the most striking lab abnormality, maybe in conjunction with that AKI. And I think the question we have to ask here is why are these platelets low, right? Um, did he all of a sudden, uh, is, this, is this a destruction problem? Is he having a, um, or a consumption problem or a production problem? Typically poor platelet production doesn't cause a such a dramatic de decrease in platelets over the last few days. So I, I'm more leaning towards either a consumptive or a destructive process. And anytime you're thinking about consumptive diseases, you wanna be thinking about those kind of microangiopathic hemolytic anemias, DIC. Um, uh, Carl, as you already said, I think we're reassured that this is probably not DIC because of the fibrinogen being, uh, being high, not, not low. Um, but I am still worried about uh, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, a TTP HUS, um, as we've said, he does have a lot of features, right? He has rash, fever, altered mental status, thrombocytopenia. Um, we do need the rest of that, uh, that hemolysis workup. Um, and again, just thinking about, you know, what else could cause this type of syndrome? I'm still thinking about a, a kind of complement mediated uh, process related to maybe an infectious endocarditis that could also cause, um, cause uh, platelet destruction, right? We do see thrombocytopenia in sepsis a lot. So kind of run of the mill sepsis can cause thrombocytopenia, typically not to this degree, right? So, um, so I think agree with the decisions to, uh, to get blood cultures, think about an LP and giving him empiric antibiotics as well as sending off uh, viral studies. I think this, when we think about infections causing this degree of thrombocytopenia, we're thinking more about typically viral processes and tick-borne uh, etiologies, I think more so than, than bacteria. Kirtan, other thoughts? Yes, so excellent discussion. And just to reverberate all of your thoughts that when you look at the urine analysis, you, we have got three plus occult blood without clear evidence of RBC or WBC cast. So that pattern is very specific and unique because usually when you have involvement of domeruli, you will see the cast, right? RBC cast, WBC cast. But as of now, we don't have any evidence of cast. 
and again coming back to our previous discussion what if this is ttp hus or endocarditis causing complement mediated hemolysis then when we talk about the thrombotic microangiopathies then this is what classically it looks like in urine analysis so thrombotic microangiopathies don't tend to cause much of rbc and wbc cas they just tend to cause plus 3 of blood and a bit of protein like plus 1 or plus 2 protein which is compatible with our urine analysis and if it is indeed ttp or hus either primary or secondary to meningooxemia hus endocarditis or henta virus or, or other infections because we know that all, all those infections can trigger hus as well as ttp because there have been some case reports where in all these tick borne infections like rickettsia leptospirosis all of them can produce auto antibodies against adempts 13 so they can cause what is known as acquired ttp so that is compatible with our findings and the fibrinogen is normal which is again in alignment with the ttp process because ctp and hus generally don't affect the fibrinogen levels like dic and if it is indeed a dic then still this could be compatible because sometimes what happens fibrinogen is an inflammatory phase protein right it is an acute phase reactant so rather than going down it can go up and can be falsely normal even in dic that's why sometimes we gets what is known as soluble fibrinogen monomer complex that is sfmc kind of thing which is more specific for d dimer and that can guide us whether it is dic or not so again i would want to make sure that we get the lp we check those common infections like staphylococci streptococci blood cultures and gococci and then some rare infections like rickettsia ehrlichia and aplasma and then what carl mentioned initially we would focus on airway maintenance breathing circulation and focus on antibiotics and so now rebecca can you tell me how we can zoom in all these differentials I think that if we're thinking about real life, we're doing exactly what you said, Kirtan. Right? We are we are both sending a very broad diagnostic workup as well as treating empirically broadly until we get that diagnostic workup back. My sense is based on the information we have here so far, I don't know that we can narrow the differential much further. I think we can, you know, try to put our nickel down, and that's what I'm going to ask each of you gentlemen to do next to say, based on all the information we have, what do you think might be the most likely diagnosis? Um, but I also think the reality is here that without I think that the the list of things that we discussed earlier, right? So um, uh, everything from viral infections to rickettsial infections to meningococcemia to endocarditis to other various, um, you know, viruses, hantavirus, leptospirosis, you know, other bacterial infections. I think these are all possibilities, um, and I would need to do more digging personally to understand exactly what you know which of these clinical features are most suggestive of each ones, um, and that's something I often do in real time. So knowing all that, Hans, do you have a, do you want to put your nickel down here? Tell us what you think the, your leading diagnosis is here. No, I think I can't put a nickel down either. I was just thinking any kind of the viruses that we listed might have to be looked after either with serology and maybe then LP gives us an idea because he shows um signs of meningitis or encephalitis. So if you have a protein, glucose, maybe a bacterial culture and a possible viral culture of the LP that can give us an idea what to look for, whether it's more viral or bacterial. Great, so it and sounds like Hans are... is, go ahead. I think it sounds like Hans is, is maybe leaning towards a, a viral meningitis. Is that- More than a viral meningitis and something must cause the platelets come down really significantly. So it's an immune related thrombocytopenia secondary to a virus. Great. But I, maybe Kirtan can explain it much better than I do. Carl, what's your, uh, where would you put your money here? All right, I'm gonna go out on a limb a little bit because I was, I, I'm still, I agree like for some of these atypical infections, um, you know, um, or, Less, less common things, at least in the Northern US, like I'd definitely be calling ID to help me with that. So I'm still like between meningococcemia and um, TTP. And you know what, just to be kind of, kind of interesting and like echo the discussion that's, that's, that we've had. Um, I'm going to say TTP, though I'm not like yet calling Hemon to plex this person. Um, I'm going to cross my fingers, we get like a normal LP and then, then maybe it's TTP. Nickel is down. And Kirtan, where's your nickel? 
Usually I usually I like rheumatologic disorder more than the infectious one. So I would like to put my nickel on TTP slash purpura fulminans. And then in the bracket, I would mention due to any infections or spontaneously. That, that would be my final thought. Beautiful. And based on the information I have, I'm still concerned about meningococcemia, I think is maybe my leading diagnosis, but thinking about Rocky Mountain spotted fever and other tick-borne infections, as well as infectious endocarditis with those kind of immune complex mediated complications being, being on my list as well. So given the time, I know we started late, but I think everybody has things to get back to. Nilayan, can you, uh, can you take us home? All right. Absolutely. So what I concur is the collective brain power of this room creators the creators the brain power of the editorial board of NEJM because the discussion here is fantastic. All right. So an LP was ordered, but that couldn't be done since the platelet were too low. A trans a trans thoracic echocardiography came out positive for a vegetation that was found on the ventricular aspect of the aortic valve, a mild MR, a mild to moderate PR. And the aortic root was not dilated. There was no evidence of aortic root abscess and no evidence of vegetations on the mitral tricuspid or pulmonary valves. And so the final diagnosis, I guess, is obvious right now. Also, all right. I also missed an investigation. A blood culture was also ordered before echocardiography, but the results came out after the echo was done and the blood culture was positive for staph aureus. So the final diagnosis is infective endocarditis secondary to staph aureus. Uh, oh, wow. I had few teaching points, which I can discuss later, uh, probably after you all have reflected. Thoughts from the discussants? Wow. How quickly did those blood cultures come back? Um, Cause yeah, I would not have necessarily seen that coming. I love that we had it on our differential. I wouldn't have put it as even in my top like two or three, but luckily I think like our management, like we covered this gentleman with vancomycin and septraxone and um, probably once I saw those blood cultures, then I'd be like, oh, pivot point, obviously staph bacteremia, we need an echo. And then, then we get to the diagnosis, but like, I love, I love how y'all um, helped me work through that. Um, yeah, humbling though, as always. Um, I'm curious how quickly those blood cultures came back. Nilayan, any, uh, any insight there? Typically, me, go, go ahead. Uh, I was gonna say for, for Staph aureus, I mean, I would say 95% of the time Staph aureus bacteremia is, is gonna grow quickly. Um, there's probably a few cases if somebody might have an occult um, deep space infection somewhere, a, a, you know, an epidural abscess or something, maybe they'll be slow or sometimes even, even not grow. Um, but, but most of the time, this is not an organism that's fastidious. That's going to take four or five days to come back. Those are probably back the next day. Yeah. Hans, your thoughts? My only thoughts are the, something that I take out of this case, the empiric antibiotics, we would have given him probably Vank and Sosin, something like this from the start because of the high temperature. And then I've learned to do an EKG and an echo. I think I always keep endocarditis in the back of my mind as a possibility. But what kind of drew me away from this was his altered mental status. How did he show such clear signs of meningitis or encephalitis? It's just mind blowing somehow so complex and uh, uh, humbling. I, I think that's a very good point. And I love the discussion that's going on in the chat here, right? So the first question that, that Azka had was, how do you link this to the altered mental status and the vomiting? Um, and I think most of us have seen patients who have severe sepsis from any cause that have a lot of systemic symptoms, right? So people who have that sympathetic overdrive that Kirtan talked about from the very beginning, causing these kind of systemic symptoms, whether that's that diaphoresis or fatigue or fever or altered mental status and vomiting. It doesn't sound like we had a clear metabolic cause of his altered mental status. I think Gabrielle brought up the possibility of whether he might have had a secondary meningitis. And it sounds like, you know, and one thing I'm curious about Nalayan is, is I don't think we know what the source of his daphoreus bacteremia was, right? 
So it's it's not very common to have a spontaneous, you know, a staph aureus uh, meningitis, although it can happen. So was this a primary meningitis that then seeded the blood or was this a bacteremia from a source that we don't yet know about that, um, you know, that may have, have caused a secondary meningitis or maybe the the headache and the, or he doesn't even have a headache, right? Maybe just the lethargy, the, the CNS findings were all just related to his severe sepsis and his fever, right? He's not all, he's not terribly old. We know that, you know, older patients as they get into their 60s, 70s, 80s, people who are mounting fevers to, to 40 degrees Celsius do definitely get encephalopathic just from fever alone. Um, so I think without a, without um, LP evidence, we could say that it's either a secondary meningitis or a, or a, a kind of Encephalopathy, encephalopathy from this fever. Yeah. So Kirtan, any last thoughts? Oh, go ahead, sorry. So sorry. So sorry, please go on, please go on. Kirtan, thoughts, reflections? Yes, so amazing discussion so far and actually very earlier in the discussion, we zoomed in on this, that common things first. So we were considering toxic shock syndrome. The Carl even mentioned the possibility of shock being a possibility. So all of those were correct. And then you also mentioned that how endocarditis can cause leodo reticularis. Endocarditis can even cause shearing of the red blood cells. So it can cause microangiopathic hemolysis as well. So it now fits very well. The only surprising part is the exposure part. And I guess the Nilayan can enlighten us on that. But uh, just looking back at the history, if you see the patient even had neck stiffness and the patient has odinophagia kind of thing like, so why the pain while slurring? So is there retropharyngeal abscess or anything like that? Because of endocarditis, we can get all these things, dissemination here and there. So maybe that was one of the clues that we might have missed, but let's see what Nilayan has to teach us. Yeah, so whatever I'm, whatever I will say from now on is I'm quoting the uh, paper and paper alone. I am not this smart. All right. So okay. So paper says that 50% of endocarditis, secondary to staph aureus, have no apparent source. We cannot localize the source. Having said that, the history of occult GI bleed made them think that this could be a strep bovis infection that is causing the infective endocarditis. And the age of 59 years old is ripe for having colonic carcinoma. So that was an initial assessment they made. And uh, I'm so sorry, what was the second question? I, okay, all right. The pain. So myalgia, uh, myalgias are a common feature of infective endocarditis, but this is, all, uh, this is outright myositis, as evidenced by the uh, rise in creatin kinase. And that is an unusual feature of infective endocarditis, which is possible, and uh, as is the case uh, in this in this presentation as well and uh, a question a possible question i had in my mind is why didn't we hear any murmur and a possible explanation that was given is the patient had tachycardia and tachycardia as we all know hides murmur so that was the reason why uh, no murmur and uh, also thrombocytopenia i think it was uh, rabi who uh, gave us this essential this amazing pearl that thrombocytopenia essentially rules out vasculitis since in inflammatory conditions we would expect thrombosis it being a uh, acute phase react and all right also the raised troponins but uh, that was explained by the fact uh, we had two theories actually one is uh, it could be a myocardial invasion uh, a direct myocardial invasion by the septic uh, uh, biobacteria or uh, emboli uh, emboli to the coronary arteries that is a uh, septic mi that sort of picture and uh, all right and why not ddp hws dic or apla so we didn't have hemolysis as such here uh, we had one plus schistocyte, but as Kirtan uh, wonderfully put it, uh, infective endocarditis can have schistocyte because of sharing of heart disease. And uh, why there's no hemolysis? Well, because uh, the indirect bilirubin is normal. And why not DIC? Because DIC is consumed to coagulopathy, and we only have a mild rise in PT. That was the explanation that was given. And uh, well, they, for APLA, they said that APLA usually happens in the face of secondary autoimmune condition. And they couldn't find any autoimmune condition here. So that's how they ruled APLA up. And I'll be happy to answer any further questions if there are any. I mean, amazing, amazing discussion. Just mind blown. Thank you, Nalayan. In the interest of time, why don't we have a, a wrap up of teaching points and remind me who's typing? I actually didn't know. Was it Sukriti or Valeria? Yeah, I'm doing teaching points and security was describing. Perfect. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you for this amazing case and discussion. It was great. And so we started off with altered mental status and vomiting as our chief complaint or chief concern, sorry.
And we always remember uh, the mnemonic for AMS, Miss Mnemonic, that um, makes us prioritize metabolic, infection, structural, and toxins as possible etiologies. And then we wanted to tie this um, altermental status with the fact that the patient had been vomiting. And so prioritizing electrolyte disturbances such as hypoglycemia, hyponatremia that are quickly reversible. And Kirtan also pointed out the possibility of endocrinopathies that could cause sympathetic hyperactivity such as hyperthyroidism. And the possibility that just uh, common etiologies such as uh, gastroenteritis could cause through hypovolemia uh, diaphoresis that uh, was like a synonym of sympathetic hyperactivity. Then uh, we learned that the patient had fever. And so one of the most uh, useful mnemonics from the CP solvers is that I made mnemonic that makes us think that fever is a synonym to inflammation. And so we should think about infection, which is the most common cause, but not the only one, because we have to consider also malignancy, autoimmune causes, drug induced, like the possibility in this patient, and endocrinopathies, and also coagulation, um, etiologies such as a PE. And the fact that the patient had neck stiffness and the acute time course of the disease uh, made Carl prioritize a CNS infection and, and give uh, empiric treatment quite quickly. And a never misdiagnosis that was also a clue because the patient had pupils uh, that were not reactive uh, is a possibility of a hyperthermia malignant syndrome caused by a many medications or herbal supplements that the patient could be taking. And also Rebecca pointed out the fact that we needed to know who the, this patient was, uh, his immune, immune status, travel history and exposures, just because uh, the possibility of tick infections that could progress with this uh, acuity and syndrome and the uh, exposure to animals as well. And so the physical exam showed us that the patient had a purpuric rash and a fever. And Kirtan gave us an amazing differential of infections, staphylococcal shock syndrome and tick-borne infections, uh, meningococcemia, something we should prioritize just because of how feminine uh, purpura can be. And also some viruses like dengue and yellow fever that are also uh, infectious etiologies. And also Kirtan, ask if this could be cons a consequence of paratomyalysis just because of hyperthermic syndrome is still in the picture or APS, vasculitis, and Rebecca um, pointed out quite early actually that um, this could also be part of an endocarditis. And so we should always keep that in mind. And, and a schema that I really love from the CP Solvers website is uh, doxy defici deficiency syndrome because you can cover a lot of infections that can be quite uh, lethal with doxycycline. And so this syndrome, it is uh, composed by headache, fever, myalgia, and it's basically etiologies that are tick-borne uh, transmitted and also the animals that I pointed out before. And then uh, we ended up with finding the patient had thrombocytopenia. And so causes of thrombocytopenia, destruction, production, or consumption problems, in which the consumption problems, we should think about uh, etiologies causing mahas, and also a mechanic uh, mimicker that can be endocarditis, or if the patient had uh, an artificial valve that can also cause a destruction by uh, friction of the RBCs and also the part of a, a place uh, problem that can cause thrombocytopenia. And so uh, we ended with an amazing discussion about how the endocarditis could, could cause the altermental status, which, which was our chief concern um, in the first aliquot. And Rebecca proposed a possibility of a secondary meningitis or part of the systemic syndrome that is cause of the staphylococcal bacteremia. And so that's all. And thank you so much for I mean, that amazing case. Beautiful summary. Thank you, Valeria. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, hopefully, those of you guys that uh, were new today to VMR um, will sign up to, to join the lukewarm seat next time. I hope, I hope you can see it's not scary. Um, it's a, hopefully, we're creating a, an inviting learning environment. This is um, an amazing opportunity that I wish I had as a student as a resident and a resident. So thank you for joining. And uh, we'll see you guys again soon. Awesome. Thank you.